Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! And I'm your host, Liv, here today with a very special episode. So a while back, um, actually pretty much at the beginning of this whole quarantine madness, I recorded a conversation with Danielle LaRose of the Tiger's Hearts Collective. They're a group out of Edmonton in Canada um, that is an all-woman theater company, and in this case, they will be performing Troilus and Cressida. Um, It was originally going to be performed live, obviously, and now that can't happen. So they're doing it through a program with the National Arts Centre in Canada that is putting on performances um, live virtually during this whole crazy mess we're all living through. Theirs will be performed on May 25th at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can find a link to the uh, site with more information and a link to where they'll actually be performing it in the episode's description. Um, Danielle and I talked for over three hours, I think, and drank a lot of wine. This is a very shortened cut of our conversation. We talk about Homer and mythology and Shakespeare's interpretation of the incredible heroes and women of the Trojan War. Troilus and Cressida is a Shakespearean play that takes place in the middle of the war. It's basically the Iliad, but in Shakespeare's time, which is fascinating in itself. We talk all about that. We talk about women in theater and feminism and everything. Honestly, it was really fun to record this. It's really fascinating, and I hope you all enjoy. So why don't we start with, why don't you tell me a little bit about what you do and therefore why you and I are speaking today. So I'm technically, I'm Canadian. Um, but you sound like I, it. <laughs> I know. I go to grocery stores and they don't believe me anymore. Because um, <laughs> I, I moved to Scotland when I was 19 um, to go and do my master's in musical theatre performance, um, which seems like a lifetime ago. And yet, also at the same time just like a blink away um I love Scotland Scotland's my favorite place in the world um and after I finished my master's degree I moved down to London as all actors do in the UK because that's you know that's where the jobs are um and uh, I started doing a lot of work with with Shakespeare uh which I loved because just the the epic nature of the stories was something that I really connected with um but also the musicality of verse everybody thinks that being you know a a musical theater person and a Shakespeare person are two separate things but to me they're they go hand in hand because Shakespeare uses musicality and um melody in his lines more than any other writer that I've come across yet um So I have a a huge connection to to that side of things. And also, like, my husband and I run a Shakespeare company together. So we do a lot of that stuff uh, together. He's from um, he's from the UK and we move back here to Edmonton, Alberta. Now I'm going to do my Canadian voice. (laughs) god do i sound like that i hope not no no <laughs> this is just my family who are from southern manitoba and so we start to sound like oh, we're from uh, <laughs> yeah yeah that's manitoba <laughs> um so yeah we've been living in edmonton for uh about four years now and we run a winter shakespeare festival but i also run a separate company which is an all-female classical performance company it's called the tiger's hearts collective yeah, and which is why you reached out to me about Troilus and Cressida, which is so cool. And somehow I've never read it or really known too much about it. Like I knew it was about, I think I knew it was about the Trojan War. I didn't know it was as much about the Trojan War as you have shown me by sending me all that information you did the other day. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a problem play, so it's not touched on very often. It's really slow moving. And it has a lot of old men talking for a long time. Weird. In the ancient world? God, that never happened. I know. It's such a standout. It's funny because I've read a lot of Shakespeare. Obviously, like I have an English degree. I did a double major in university between classics and English. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, all the ones you have to read when you're in high school in Canada, too. Yeah. But I've never... I mean, I just haven't read, I guess, too many of the 
the less obvious ones. Now that I'm thinking about it, probably almost none of the less obvious ones. I had to read King Lear, which is still very obvious. He wrote that while uh, he was oh yeah, right, potentially in, in quarantine, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of people reference it now, either because you shouldn't feel like you need to be like Shakespeare and write something like King Lear in quarantine or because you should and there's just a good combination of the two on Twitter these days right I mean the pressure is real absolutely as someone who's been like aching for free time from my day job for months right and now suddenly I have it and I feel like I can't do almost anything it's so bizarre and I like all I want to do is write extra episodes of the podcast or finish the books I've been saying I'm going to finish yeah. forever. And then I sit down and I end up on Twitter. There's there's yeah, there's a real huge pressure to be just creating content. And um, as a person who usually creates that content with other people physically in a room, um, it's it's terrifying and exciting you know this is a this is an online medium that i'm not very used to to using but i have to harness it and i have to make it work for me in order to make a living for the next couple of months or however long it's going to be but um but yeah there are days when i just like oh the the burden of of creating content by myself and not being able to have people there physically with me is really strange and new and and scary. I I can only imagine. I mean, mine is always by myself. Mm -hmm. And even that I'm having trouble with simply because I'm now by myself too much because I live alone too. So I'm just with me alone in my head constantly. And then so actually trying to find that creativity has been trying. Well, and it's a fascinating testament to why we need theater and why we need you know those in-person experiences because there's only so much Netflix you can watch and there's only so much time you can spend alone before you really need to feel the vibrations of other voices and other people with you in a space in order to you know connect to the more primal sides of of ourselves and I think obviously you know that the the Greeks knew that you have to have a yearly festival where you get together and you talk about the shit that we do as you know, humanity, the whole, and uh, kind of come out on the other side, maybe maybe having learned something or felt something. And beforehand, you have to watch the phalloi dance around the city. Oh, obligatory. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> we do that at, at, at all Shakespeare uh, performances. <laughs> I really hope that's true. <laughs> the Shakespeare's in the park I've seen in my life have proven that not to be the case, but I hope that's what they do in Edmonton, at least. This is why we need all female <laughs> classical theater companies. Perfect. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about Troilus and Cressida. Oh, yes, let's. So uh, I didn't have a chance to read much of it at all. But like you said, I know the Trojan War. So I just want to, I mean, chat about the fact that there is just straight up a Shakespeare play about the Trojan War that I didn't really realize. So, well, I mean, I think it's really interesting that you're coming at it from a point of um, being familiar with the Trojan War, but not necessarily being familiar with the play, because obviously that's where uh, Shakespeare's audience would have been coming at it from. You know, he writes about all of these epic heroes that all of his audience members would have been totally and completely at home with they would have been household names everyone knows the story of achilles everyone knows obviously shakespeare uses the um the roman names for everybody because the brits are obsessed with this weird idea that that brutus founded britain and so they are roman in lineage because also i think a lot of times um it was translated into Latin and then the English was translated from the Latin, not necessarily from the ancient Greek. Yeah. So it became more Roman because of that, which is just wrong. <laughs> um, but it's really interesting. And just because, I mean, the Romans did control Britain for a time. So then you have that aspect as well. And then the mm-hmm. Romans also loved Homer's work and the whole story. So, I mean, it's just so, been so interesting over so much time to see how yeah how it's become 
sort of taken on by by completely different languages and cultures. Yeah, well, and I mean, Shakespeare was living at a time when the Reformation had a had a huge impact on everything that everyone did. It's interesting to think about the situation that Shakespeare found himself in writing these epic characters, these big, big heroes that everyone um, everyone knew about from antiquity, whether it was from, from the, the Roman point of view or not. And he takes them down. He really mm-hmm. does. So what? So tell me about that, just because I haven't um, read it. And then also, I obviously want to talk, talk about Troilus and Cressida in general, because they, unless I've missed something in a different source, are certainly not from the Iliad. No. They're invented by Shakespeare. They're, uh, they're invented... Uh, I'd have to else. yeah I'd have to I'd have to have a look at um exactly when we first see them. Uh, I think we first see them in an Italian romance novella which is Oh interesting. which is um taken on board by Chaucer who wrote uh his version of Troilus and Cressida. Oh that I recognize too that. Yeah. Name, yeah. So I think Shakespeare has taken this story from Chaucer and and combined it or or reinserted it back into into Homer's uh, world of of the Iliad and the Trojan War story. Interesting. That's fascinating. It's just funny seeing it from this end of it um just because I have all my knowledge comes from the ancient sources and certainly the Roman too so I understand the Ulysses of it all and all that but then mm-hmm. yeah the all of the where it transitions into English history is really interesting as well. Mm-hmm. Well, and the interesting part about having to having to tell this story as as Shakespeare tells it, or even just you know taking the text that he gives us and and trying to find an accessible world and create a world that the audience can really latch onto, you have to make certain decisions. It can't be as open-ended as, oh, well, we have loads of sources for how Ajax behaves, for example, in his challenge with Hector. We have loads of sources, and that's true. But when you're creating a world that an audience then has to buy into, you have to make certain decisions and make them concrete in order to, um, in order for that world to really be believable. So um, how is Ajax in, in Shakespeare's world? totally totally dumb very blunt instrument really like (laughs) couldn't find his own ass if someone pointed him backwards kind of thing (laughs) like comedically dumb or um tragically dumb comedically dumb definitely interesting yeah that's really interesting because of course in the Iliad I mean for a long time he is just sort of an important hero and then he goes into the whole berserker yeah. man you know ptsd in war kind of situation which is very different from being comedically stupid <laughs> yeah and we don't see any of that any of that post hector's death like that's where the play ends hector is killed we don't even barely leave the field so we don't get any of ajax's you know freak out afterwards and the ptsd stuff afterwards oh that's so interesting It might be easier if I give a little quick synopsis of Shakespeare's version of the play. So I I thought about putting together an all-female production of Troilus and Cressida maybe about a year ago, um, just because it's it's a play that's so um, heavily masculine and has... And, it, and it's underperformed as well. So it's a play that we're not really familiar with. And that often gives us license to um, take over the story a little bit more and to have a little bit more um, autonomy over, over the story that we're telling. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating to me because obviously Homer's Iliad version is one of the first stories that we have um, that's heavily influenced Western culture as far as how we conceive of gender and gender performativity and uh, the worth of one gender over another. Um, so that's something that I was really, really keen to explore with with this particular play. Because we start off being introduced to Troilus, 
who is a prince of Troy. He's a son of Priam. He's one of the youngest, and he's coming back in from a day out on the battlefield. We find ourselves in Medias Res, just like Homer uh, drops us in at the beginning of of the Iliad. Shakespeare does the exact same thing. Um, But instead of setting us up for a huge war epic, he calls his play Troilus and Cressida, which for most of Shakespeare's audience at the time, and I think for most of our contemporary audiences as well, leads you to believe that you're coming into a story about a romance, right? About these two lovers and in a dangerous time coming together despite all the odds. Um, and, and it might be tragic like Romeo and Juliet, but, but they're still going to be, you know, an ideal couple for us. So we meet Troilus right at the beginning and, um, and we meet Cressida very, very soon after as well. And they have this fantastic go-between called Pandarus. And he is dirty as fuck. He has got all of these ulterior motives to like spending time with Troilus or um, getting Cressida to, to say things that maybe aren't very ladylike. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have a, we'll have a little scene from, uh, from Jamie who is playing our Pandarus because he really is a delightful misogynist and, and a delightful, uh, disease riddled man. He's very, very bad. Um, so we're thrust into Troy with these, these romantic lovers almost as soon as we meet them and we learn that they're in love and we learn that they're trying to get together. We then go to the complete opposite side and Shakespeare throws us into the Greek camp where we see Agamemnon, Nestor, Ulysses, uh, Menelaus, all of these heroes of, um, of, of the Iliad together debating about what's going to happen next. And it is boring. <laughs> it's long and dull. All of these speeches that they have are, are super, super dry trying to figure out what they're going to do next because Achilles has, of course, been out of the action for a long time. I mean, it's it's fascinating because Shakespeare sets us up for a romance with Troilus and Cressida. We meet them. All of a sudden we're in the Greek camp and we're, you know, totally taken into this world of fusty old men debating and this this huge bureaucratic hierarchical uh, issue that they're having. And we kind of go back and forth between the, the bureaucratic world of the Greek camp and the bureaucratic world of, of, of Troy and why they're keeping Helen. Um, and eventually we come to the end where there's a huge battle but it's actually really hard to uh, describe a synopsis of the play because on the one hand it's very domestic and we're following Troilus and Cressida's story on the other hand it's 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 got a huge scope that's trying to take into account the entirety of of the the Trojan War but it does a really bad job of of that aspect because Shakespeare is more focused on on the spirit of men talking to men about how to do the thing of war without actually doing anything. It's it fascinating. Sounds like so much of the Iliad, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean he's he's definitely understanding Homer in that respect, right? Yeah. So in Shakespeare's version, is Achilles also being like an angry little jerk and? Oh, he is so luxurious. He is he is such a pretty boy and he's 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 made to be very feminine, which is part wow. of the reason why I wanted to explore this play with an all-female cast because we have we have characters like like Ulysses who is describing um Achilles, our main man. Absolutely. Main man. <laughs> Regardless of his name, he is my main man. In part because Sean Bean plays him in Troy. Sean and Bean. I also live for Sean Bean. <laughs> live for him. Um, what I might actually do is just read you the prologue, if that's okay. Absolutely. Shakespeare is already starting to be really naughty with the prologue, which, which goes like this. <laughs> in Troy, there lies the scene. From isles of Greece, the princes Orgulus, their high blood chafed, have to the port of Athens sent their ships, fraught with the ministers and instruments of cruel war. Sixty and nine that wore their crown its regal from the Athenian bay put forth towards Phrygia, and their vow is made to ransack Troy. 
within whose strong immures the ravished Helen, Menelaus' queen, with wanton Paris sleeps. And that's the quarrel. To Tenedos they come, and the deep-drawing barks do there disgorge their warlike freightage. Now, on Darden plains, the fresh and yet unbruised Greeks do pitch their brave pavilions. Priam's six-gated city, Darden and Timbria, Helius, Catus, Trojan, and Antinorides, with massy staples and corresponsive and fulfilling boats, spar up the sons of Troy. Good God, Shakespeare, get get on with it <laughs> now expectation it sounds like homer <laughs> right <laughs> now expectation tickling skittish spirits on one and other side trojan and greek sets all on hazard and hither am i come a prologue armed but not in confidence of author's pen or actor's voice but suited in like conditions as our argument to tell you, fair beholders, that our play leaps o'er the vaunt and firstlings of those broils, beginning in the middle, starting thence away to what may be digested in a play. Like or find fault, do as your pleasures are. Now good or bad, tis but the chance of war. And already Shakespeare is like, here we find ourselves in an impossible situation, I'm going to drop you in right in the middle of the action, and uh, you just draw your own conclusions, whether you like it or not. Prologues are great, because they give they give you a, like, temperature. One interesting like, thing I found is that they refer to Athens. Oh, yes. We've got, um, have to the port of Athens sent their ships, fraught with the ministers and instruments of cruel war. So Shakespeare is already telling us, because all of his audience members would have been familiar, or many of his audience members would have been familiar with the story of the Iliad. He says, you know, we've already been to Athens. Um, we've already we've already done that bit. We've already sacrificed Iphigenia at Aulis. We've already, you know, gathered all the ships. Um, but But he does kind of blanket all of the princes as being Athenian rather than being Argives or Hellenes. Um, Athenian is kind of the, the, the phrase that he uses. So it's interesting to have him not use a generalized Greek or Hellenes because I mean, even yeah, as much as the uh, Iliad uses too many different ways to describe the Greeks. um, I mean, you've, got Achaeans and Argives and well Argives is specific but Achaeans and uh, Danians and everything for mm-hmm. Greeks but mm-hmm. I find that really fascinating too of having to kind of modernize it by specifically saying Athenians as if right? there is no other part but yeah. I just find that fascinating as soon as I saw the word Athens I was like wait I've got questions <laughs> okay I use the the Arden Shakespeare's for all of the plays that we do and they've got they've got a note about the port of Athens and it says Shakespeare took this detail of the mustering of the Greek ships at Athens um, from his more immediate sources so he's um, he's not necessarily focusing just on on Homer but he's also looking at Aeschylus and Euripides um, Mm, and other classical authors assembling uh, assembling the um, the warlike freightage, as he puts it, uh, as taking place at Aulis, like just north of Athens, right? So he kind of brings Aulis down and, and makes it a part right. of a part of Athens. Which is interesting because the Athenians, in terms of Aeschylus and everybody, tended, if not exclusively, set their plays outside of Athens so that they could properly judge the people. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah. as if they weren't Athenians. So even most most Greek tragedies don't take place in Athens specifically so that the people could be judged and they wouldn't be judging Athenians, which is always interesting too. So Well, Shakespeare does the exact same thing. Like the only the only plays that we have of his that are set in England are the histories. Right. But all right. of the, all of the plays that he uses to explore, you know, I suppose <laughs> problems like for example mm. the merchant of venice occurring in venice rather than rather than in england and he's exploring other cultures from a safe distance you know like athenians explored themselves from a safe distance by placing things in thebes or or wherever no but that's really fascinating just because uh i mean it's it's interesting to see that so very many years later the same kind of idea stands of if you're going to provide some kind of um 
social commentary, you know, make it set somewhere else so that you're not judging your own people when you do. Yeah. Well, and that's part of the reason why I'm always wanting to um, explore the classics because they are that bit removed from us and yet not removed. You know, we can we can explore the classics and we can tell those stories and they can still be as important to us now as they were 500 years ago if we're talking about Shakespeare or 3000 years ago if we're talking about Homer. Um, we're, we're that little bit removed because time gives us that privilege but but we're it is also uh as immediate as as we want it to be i don't know if that's something that you've come across doing the podcast and in exploring um myth from where you're at in in your world and in the the you know contemporary zeitgeist yeah i mean that's that's basically why I'm doing the podcast and and also at the same time the source of all my bad reviews <laughs> is the fact that my intention is to love and you know interpret and sort of obsess over these ancient stories but at the same time view them from the world now where um owning women and people was not great you know it's not great now and so I'm going to tell the stories as if it's not awesome to own other people no it's and not awesome and yet, it's not awesome yet, yet people, people continue but, to do it and the majority of my bad reviews are people who are like just tell the stories leave the commentary out and I'm like just listen to another fucking podcast then because right? the commentary is my thing like why the fuck are you here it's a strange thing. It's a strange relationship that people have with the classics because obviously you and yes. I have, you know, a very meaningful relationship with the material. But that meaningful relationship isn't isn't. I'm not just going to put it up on a pedestal and leave it there exactly. as the We're representation of exactly because it's got yeah. so much patriarchal and colonial bullshit and that white comes supremacist to it. exactly. And Whew. I'm I. I recognize in myself that I have a connection to these stories because they're epic and they're human and they're true, but that doesn't make them right and that doesn't make them beyond reproach. Yeah, that's exactly what I come to the podcast with is that I deeply love them to a problematic point of like just the way I feel about these stories and the connection I feel to them. But at the same time, they are not perfect. They were dark as fuck. Zeus was a horrible rapist. Absolutely. And I'm never not going to say that just because the history books will tell you he carried her off. Like, cool. Read a history book that'll say he carried her off because I'm going to say what actually happened, which is yeah. never he carried her off because that's not a thing. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no, I mean, it's yeah, it's very interesting to to be in that position where like you can love them quite obsessively and still recognize that they are very flawed. But isn't it fascinating how as women, we're expected to only admire women and only admire righteous people, uh, women, <laughs> people, <Yeah>. women. <laughs> um, so that when we do have heroes like Odysseus and when we do connect with characters like Achilles and we do find ourselves in these problematic characters that we are put down for it that we're yeah. you know we're we're you know thrown on the on the pyre or we're you know tied to the <laughs> tied to the stake so to speak um just because we're connecting with a with a character that men are allowed to connect with until the cows come home that's true yeah i often have to defend how much i love odysseus which is it, i've never quite seen it that way i've just sort of defended it as he's fucking problematic as hell but i still love him and he's not as problematic as a lot of them right i mean we're all human beings we're all problematic and that's the way that shakespeare writes his characters in this particular play like that's that's one of the reasons that i wanted to do charles and cressida because he takes these epic heroes who have been without fault for however many thousands of years and he takes them down and he turns them into actual human beings and as a female um Shakespearean I can see myself in the hubris of Achilles I I can't pretend that as a woman 
I, <laughs> I've got some kind of righteousness about me that makes me untouchable as far as as far as hubris or violence or anger goes. I am very violent and I am very angry as a person because humanity. So I should be allowed to connect with Achilles and with the the journey that he is having, and not just the the female characters that were given in the classical world. Especially with an example like Achilles, too. I mean, it's it's so true. I mean, it, if we women were, you know, sort of locked into what we could and could not connect with, I mean, there's no way I could connect with Greek mythology writ large. I, there's so, I mean, who who even knows how to fully describe the women that end up in Greek mythology, but right. they're all, you know, based in the patriarchy that created them. Mm-hmm. And I can still find a way to love it and just retell it in my own damn way. But it's interesting to use Achilles as an example. You were mentioning Song of Achilles, right? Yeah. After after you talked about it on the podcast, um, I <laughs> I made it mandatory reading <laughs> for all of our all of our cast members. Um, Amazing. Respect that completely. Just because I think we need to we need to respect Madeline Miller's obvious talent for taking classical stories and and putting them into a contemporary um uh voice she knows so much about the history so much about the world um and she's you know just done a fantastic job from the point of view of authorship integrity and historian integrity um but it's a great story and it's it's you can buy it's into such a it good story it's so it's just so touching so i thought that was that was really important for us to acknowledge um women who are who are right now recreating the classics for our generation and madeline miller is one of those and pat barker of course with her silence of the girls is another one how um i don't know how it's possible necessarily in the shakespeare to to make these kind of decisions but do you do you handle achilles and patroclus in any kind of special way because you've read song of achilles or like how do you view them now I think whenever you're approaching uh, a play that has to create a world for your audience, you always have to know the story that you're in. So that story is informed by us all having read Song of Achilles. And that story is informed by um, all of the conversations that we have about the character in the room. But at the end of the day, we have to present a character and offer a character that is one true to the the actor who's playing that that part true two to what what the what the text gives us um and and three fits within the world of the rest of the play so for example with with Achilles and Patroclus we really played with ambiguity I left it up to um Alex and Sam to the actors who were playing those parts to make up their own minds in a private and intimate way um what their relationship was about um so we asked questions like uh you know have there been intimate relations are you in love with each other when what what's your first memory of that other person um and the ambiguity of that is is really really beautiful especially within a play and a story where people have expectations where you see Achilles and Patroclus and people say, oh, they're lovers or, oh, they're cousins or, oh, they're (laughs) gay. Um, And we automatically project our expectations onto them. But if you give an audience an ambiguous story from the outside, that from the inside is very specific. It's fascinating to watch what happens because they become so much more human and complex and messy and, Often with the classics, we, you know, it's all too easy to put people into boxes. But if if you allow them to be human and messy, then they're so much more believable because you can't necessarily pin them down. Okay, so we should talk about the women in this play, though, because they are fucking fascinating we have so the players we've got uh helen obviously she's crazy fascinating because we only see her in one scene or there's cressida 
obviously, who isn't necessarily a, a character in the Iliad that um, your listeners will be uh, familiar with, but there is also Cassandra, who your listeners will be familiar with. And Damn right. I love, I love Shakespeare's Cassandra. She's just brilliant. Um, we have Andromache as well, Hector's wife. Um, ominously, we don't get to meet Hecuba, which is crazy. Mm. Um, mm. It's just those four, those four women. I see that Cassandra kind of starts things off. Is that right? It is in, in what you sent me as the shortened version. So why don't you tell me about Cassandra in this? So Cassandra is very, very similar to Shakespeare cleaves very closely to um, the idea that Cassandra speaks truth to power, but is never really listened to and her advice is never heeded. So she is still this this person who's been cursed by Apollo to prophesy and not be believed. And um, the scene the scene that we meet Cassandra in, um, you know how we were talking about landing in the Greek camp and them talking about uh, in very long winded terms about <laughs> about no, you know not knowing what to do about how to win the war. Mm-hmm. We have uh, we have a mirror scene in in Troy where Priam and his sons are talking about whether or not they should keep Helen. <laughs> In like some of the most disgusting terms oh. that you've that you've ever heard, um, like like where where does and Troilus is one of, is one of the major um, offenders regarding how we talk about Helen, which is crazy because he's he's painted as this romantic figure who's in love with Cressida. And then he turns around and, and he says things like, um, so Troilus talking about returning Helen uh, says, I take today a wife and my election is led on in the conduct of my will, my will enkindled by mine eyes and ears. And he goes on to talk about how he's going to choose a wife as if he's at market. Um <laughs> <laughs> and then and then Sorry. he says right right and then he says we turn not back the silks upon the merchant when we have soiled them oh i read that part that's lovely right and and when i directed this i had i had troilus go and and say this right in paris's face because obviously he is the main he's the main offender well he's soiled those silks yeah those uh nor, nor the remainder oh. viands we do not throw in unrespective sieve because we now are full. We don't just vomit up the the <laughs> the remainder like meats that we've just glutted ourselves on just because we're full. It's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh. Right. Troilus is he's young and he's impressionable and he's a fa- he's a he's a fascinating example of how toxic masculinity can go bad if um mm. you know if you're if you're presented with the with the kind of expectations that are that are placed on Troilus. And then and then Cassandra just bursts into this this council uh, atmosphere where all of these men are talking about this woman as if she's a prize and if she's a commodity to be traded, um, as if she's a bomb about to go off. And then Cassandra enters and she's, you know, completely distraught. She's saying, cry, Trojans, cry. Um, Lend me 10,000 eyes and I will fill them with prophetic tears. Virgins and boys, mid-age and wrinkled old, soft infancy that nothing canst but cry, add to my clamours. Let us pay betimes a moiety of that mass of moan to come. To cry, Trojans, cry, practice your eyes with tears. Troy must not be, nor goodly Ilium stand. Our firebrand brother Paris burns us all. Cry, Trojans, cry, a Helen and a woe. Cry, cry, Troy burns, or else let Helen go. And then she's gone. Wow. She just stands there in this awkward, awkward silence. And um, we don't, yeah, we don't hear her again until later on. But uh, she bursts into this council situation. She pours her heart out 
and and begs them to let Helen go because she sees the future of, of blood and fire and death because of Paris, because of our firebrand brother Paris burns us all. Hmm. And they just don't register it at all. There's no oh. believing women. Well, that's Apollo's curse, right? It's like... As much as it's about believing women, it's also about that specific woman who's just... I mean, it, of course, it spread, it obviously connects with sort of everything. But, I mean, he would be very wrong to have them believe her. I would just... Yeah. It's her whole curse, which is fascinating and, and interesting in that way. I mean, it's just beautifully written by Shakespeare in that way. Just in, the, of course, the iambic pentameter helps and then mm-hmm. the the rhyming and just it's all so powerful Mm -hmm. well and Hector almost believes her like he Mm. he offers he offers everybody the option to consider what Cassandra is arguing um Hmm. and so (laughs) Shakespeare kind of toys with our hearts in that way that we know that they're never going to believe her but he gives us a character that gives us the option of believing her um which is then, of course, trampled in the dirt. Right. So even more, it's just more meaningful and powerful than than even in the Homer where you're like, uh, everyone should believe her and we're just going to watch as no one does. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. How is um how is the relationship between Paris and Helen in this? Is it any kind of romantic love or is it all just sort it's of horrible? It's so and- weird. <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) it's so, so weird. So just to just to give it context from that same scene we've just been talking about, about this Trojan Council scene, he he talks about um, the license he's been given by Priam and the other elders of Troy who said, you know, go off, take Helen that they they treated as if it was um, it was a conversation that they had before Paris uh, went off to Sparta. and they and and he says, you know, Dad, you gave me full uh, consent to go and do this thing and and take Helen, and I did. Um, and and now you're expecting me as an individual just to to bear to bear all of this weight by myself when really uh, you gave me every reason to do it. Your full propension. Um, gave wings and and cut off all fears attending on so dire a project for what alas can these my single arms what propugnation is in one man's valor to stand the push and enmity of those this quarrel would excite so he he's been given um he's been given a valid reason to go and and abduct helen and then he's <laughs> oh, and this just makes me cringe because Priam re- responds by saying, Paris, you speak like one besotted on your sweet delights. You have the honey still, but these the gall. So to be valiant is no praise at all. And Paris responds by saying, I would have the soil of her fair rape wiped off in honourable keeping her. What treason were it to the ransacked queen, disgrace to your great worths and shame to me now to deliver her possession up on terms of base compulsion. So he's really just talking about, I may have stolen her. If we're talking about, we're talking about rape in the, in the, in the Greek usage of the term, but I, you know, I would wipe off all of that dishonorable action uh, in order to, in order to keep her as as a prize to be won and to be fought for um because there's not the meanest spirit of our party when helen is defended nor none so noble whose life were ill bestowed or death unfamed where helen is the subject so she becomes becomes this you know impossible ideal so yeah he <laughs> disgustingly thinks that he can just as a man he has the power to wipe away all of the shit that he's done and how it's changed the life of this woman um and just you know validate it because it was an honorable thing to do and she is a theme of honor and renown and she's worth fighting for because she's not a person 
She's an object and an ideal. If Helen is anything in all of these stories, it is that. And then we see her. We do see her in this one scene. This one weird scene with Paris and Pandarus, who is this like really gross voyeuristic uncle who's going between Troilus and Cressida, the lovers. Um, and so Paris and, and Helen are listening to music together. Uh, and, and Pandarus comes in and kind of interrupts and he's been sent on an errand by Troilus to kind of make excuses while Troilus and Cressida have their first night together. Um, but all Helen says is like, Oh, my Lord Pandarus, honey, sweet Lord, thou shalt not bob us out of our melody. If you do, our melancholy above your upon, upon your head. Oh, sweet, sweet queen, sweet, sweet queen. And it's all this very convoluted shit, which is which is fascinating because even even Shakespeare doesn't give us a representation of Helen that's particularly personable or you know, particularly leaning one side or the other. We don't really get from this reading of Helen um, whether she went with Paris of her own accord or mm -hmm. whether she, uh, sh whether she was abducted. Um, she kind of keeps her secrets because that's what she needs to do in order to survive this, this place. Yeah. So it doesn't really pick a side in that. It's just sort of, she's there to your own interpretation. Mm -hmm. And she like she she shows a little bit of of humanity because she does she does make a very uh, dirty joke. Uh, Pandarus is talking about Cressida and Paris kind of being cousins, and uh, and and he says they two are twain, and she responds with saying falling in after falling out may make them three. <laughs> so like having sex then somebody could get pregnant and they could become three people so she does have a <laughs> <laughs> she does have a little dirty joke that she gets in there that makes her kind of human that's part of the reason why i wanted to um explore helen the character from so many different perspectives so the way that we approached her uh in the in the rehearsals was helen was a mask so obviously we were doing homage to uh our greek theater origins um mm -hmm. but also tackling this play had hidden bruises for a lot of us that we were you know approaching in the room as far as as far as being women in the world as far as being um, female performers in in uh, in a in a classical theater tradition that has a lot of a lot of challenges that comes along with it, um, and representing Helen is a huge burden. She is the epitome of what women are expected to be, you know. Um, and I really, I really tried to explore this idea of Helen as the every woman. And it, you know, it comes with all sorts of caveats, like you have to be silent, but you also have to be chaste, but you also have to be sexy, but you also have to be this. And you also have to be all of these contradicting things that live in Helen. Right. So so by making Helen the mask and allowing every single one of our female actors to play Helen at a certain point um, was fascinating because masks can't speak in in the theatrical tradition that most of us coming from drama school are used to you put on a mask and then you have to use your body to communicate to communicate exclusively you're not allowed to use your voice so that meant that the other actors had to speak for helen while she was wearing the mask which was also fascinating that's a such a wonderful idea do i mean for all the reasons you just said and then that connection you have to the original greek tragedy where everyone wore masks and so the dialogue was important but also it was all about body language because you couldn't see the faces moving like you're saying and so it's just it's very true to greek tragedy and true to the idea of greek tragedy where you know there were other than the chorus, there was only ever three people on the stage. And so you yeah. had different people playing multiple characters. So it's it's very accurate and very powerful to make that decision when it comes to Helen. 
And I think it's powerful to put the audience into that position of reminding themselves where we come from as far as theatrical traditions go. You know, if 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 you think about Shakespeare, you don't necessarily think mask right away, but all of a sudden you mm-hmm. put a mask on stage and we're reminded about our our roots as as you know a human race going back to why we need theater to to represent our trials and our tribulations and our joys and our traumas and all of these things that we share and why we come together as a community to share these things in person (laughs) preferably um Mm. rather than online when there's not a plague yeah exactly and and how necessary it is to to see ourselves in in characters that we can you know imbue in masks and also for the actors you know it's a huge burden for one single actor i mean think about how how many times you've seen helen represented on stage or screen you know like in uh, in the netflix troy uh episodes or in in brad pitt's troy you know those are two very very different helens um, mm-hmm. but that actor has to take on the burden of representing that woman of women, that, that, yeah, that just flagship of womanhood. Flagship is such a good word specifically too, for the, the not Shakespeare, but Marlowe interpretation of her. Oh yes. The of, face that launched a thousand ships. Exactly. The one that, the, the line that everyone attributes to ancient Greece, which is very much not ancient Greek. <laughs> and Shakespeare always makes fun of it. He does. Always, he? Always. I mean, <laughs> I'm taking it again from like last night I watched Shakespeare in love and they quote it. Yeah. Um, but I love, I love the idea that, that then he also just mocked it. That's fun. <laughs> he totally does. In, in, uh, in the scene where they're in Troy and they're talking about whether or not they should uh, keep Helen, Troilus makes fun of her and says, um, yeah, the, she is the face that launched above a thousand ships. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, okay, Shakespeare, Marlowe's pro- Marlo's dead by now. You don't need to keep <laughs> making fun of him. But I mean, you know, he he one upped him with that one line, so you might as well make fun of him for every time he can. I like that. And now that's what everybody knows about Marlo. <laughs> that's the thing. That's truly the only thing I know about Marlo. I I love just comparing the the ways that we've interpreted all these things over time. Just the fact that this has existed for so long that there can be so many varied interpretations of it, like that. Well, and the blame that we pay, that we place on Helen, like by Absolutely. immortalizing this line, the face that launched above a thousand ships, it was her beauty is the the scapegoat to all of men's misdeeds, mm-hmm. and it's her fault for being, and so it's beautiful. her fault. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As if she had anything to do with the matter as if she had any say whatsoever Mm. um i mean troilus says it very very early on in the play um helen must needs be fair when daily with your blood you paint her thus Mm. you know she she has to be beautiful and she has to be the epitome of of womanhood and of beauty in order to be um worthy of all of this death and all of this bloodshed yeah, absolutely. I mean, God, if Helen of Troy is anything, it's just sort of the embodiment of all, any kind of male insecurity or uh, hatred of women. It's She is sort of the cause of everyone's problems. It's all about Helen. And I think this interpretation of her is is just such a good example of that, but also a really interesting way of looking at it uh, beyond her as that figure of of just every problematic thing in the world in one woman oh thank you all for listening to this very special episode i hope you all learned something about shakespeare or generally just enjoyed it or like hearing me talk to another badass woman about feminism and women in Greek mythology. I know I can talk about it forever, so I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. I am Liv, and I love this shit.